Hello guys, if you've never been here before, then hello and welcome to the show. My name is Hashem and I'm a University of Cambridge graduate and student doctor and this is Doctor Tell Me Why. I thought that today would be as good a day as any to talk about psilocybin, the active ingredient in magic mushrooms and its potential role in treating mental health issues and psychiatric illness. Specifically, treatment-resistant depression and alcohol dependence. It's a fascinating area of research that is absolutely booming right now. And so, in this video I'll be telling you about the possible biological mechanisms through which psychedelics are believed to act on the brain to alleviate or treat mental health issues. And then next I'll be giving you a summary of the research and looking at two specific case studies, treatment-resistant depression and alcohol dependence, and answering the all-important question. Are psychedelics really the future of psychiatry? But before I do any of that, I think it's important for me to give you a quick crash course on the history of it all, specifically how psychedelics like LSD and psilocybin went from being the cool kids on the block to being perceived as being highly dangerous and actually being quite illegal, essentially crippling scientific research and halting all progress in the field for decades to come. Long story short, this video will include just about everything that you've ever wanted to know about psilocybin and magic mushrooms, their fall from grace and the resurgence of scientific interest and research. As always, you should find links in the description below to the full research papers if you want to have a read of them yourself. In the description, you should also be able to find chapters if you want to skip ahead to the parts of the video that interest you the most. That is absolutely fine. Alternatively, you could watch this video from start to finish and enjoy looking at my very beautiful face. And also also, my amazing hair. Today is a great day because this is one of the very few days where I get a good hair day. Subscribers to this channel know that this does not happen a lot. <laughs> And if you find yourself enjoying this video at any point, then I think what's best for both you and me is for you to subscribe to the channel. Doctor Tell Me Why offers its subscribers weekly science videos about the latest groundbreaking medical research. I also get to tell you guys about the most fascinating medical conditions and give you top tips on living a healthier life. No reason not to subscribe really. Psilocybin is a naturally occurring psychedelic prodrug that is found in over 200 species of fungi. We call it a prodrug because psilocybin is not actually psychedelic personally, but when consumed it is converted into its active psychedelic form inside your body, psilocine. And psilocine can produce a range of effects from euphoria and changes in perception to perceived spiritual experiences and even visual and mental hallucinations. Which explains why the Aztecs in Central America were very fond of the stuff, using it regularly as part of their spiritual and religious ceremonies since at least 200 AD. Upon the Spanish conquest of Central America, however, Catholic missionaries, very scary people, worked very hard to stamp out the practice of consuming hallucinogenic plants, believing that these mushrooms, these psychedelic mushrooms, allowed the indigenous people to communicate with demons. And that was it for the most part, until an article was published in Life magazine in 1957, detailing a trip to Mexico undertaken by Robert and Valentina Wasson, where they just happened to try some psychedelic magic mushrooms. As you do on a trip to Mexico, these Catholic missionaries definitely did a good job stamping out demon worship in Central America, didn't they? But just one year later, in 1958, Albert Hoffman was able to identify psilocybin and psilocine as the active ingredient in magic mushrooms. And so so the 1960s became a kind of a golden age for psychedelic research, yielding some of the most promising results and research in the history of all psychiatry. It appeared that psychedelic trips were able to produce profound changes in consciousness and induce new levels of self-awareness, with potential therapeutic benefit in the treatment of a number of mental health issues. Remember that this was the age where patients struggling with mental illness were still subjected to lobotomies and electroshock treatments on a regular basis. And now there were these new wonder drugs that appeared to have such enormous potential in the treatment of neurosis, schizophrenia and alcohol dependence, and even started being prescribed to children with autism. However, it was not to be. In 1970, the Controlled Substances Act became law, essentially drying up all government funding for research into psychedelic drugs, 
with procurement of the controlled substance LSD and psilocybin becoming virtually impossible. The US government did such an effective job at convincing the public that psychedelics were very dangerous drugs that these attitudes still persist to this day. According to The Economist, magic mushrooms and LSD are some of the safest drugs around falling far behind alcohol, tobacco, and cannabis. And yet still, young adults continue to see using LSD once or twice in their lifetimes as being significantly more dangerous to their health than binge drinking on a weekly basis. The truth was, of course, far more complicated. Federal authorities in the United States associated psychedelics with student riots and anti-war demonstrations, and opted to criminalize psychedelic drugs like psilocybin and LSD. SD, to preserve the moral fabric of society. How did that work out? US President Richard Nixon would eventually go on to label famed Harvard psychologist and psychedelic advocate Timothy Leary the most dangerous man in America. I suppose only second to himself. Car 727, car 727, open door at the Watergate office building. The key target for psychedelic drugs is believed to be the 5-HT2A serotonin receptor, where it acts to stimulate that receptor. Serotonin is a key hormone that is believed to be important for regulating mood, well-being, and general happiness. And that's why first-line antidepressants tend to be SSRIs, or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. The idea is that by re-inhibiting the reuptake of serotonin, you could increase the pool of available serotonin in the brain and elevate mood and well-being. And if you would like me to make a video about this in the future, then make sure you subscribe to the channel and leave a comment below. And it's believed that psilocybin acting on the serotonin 5-HT2A receptors can stimulate them and thereby increase the pool of available serotonin too. The advent of neuroimaging has also allowed us to visualize the brains of depressed subjects, identifying that depressed people were significantly more likely to show overactivity in the default mode network, an area of the brain that includes the medial prefrontal cortex, posterior cingulate cortex, and the angular gyrus. It should be interesting to note then that the intake of psilocybin was found to reduce activity in the default mode network, the same area of the brain that is is shown to be hyperactive in depressed people. It's also believed that through overstimulating the 5-HT2A receptor, psychedelic agents may be able to make neuronal connections more flexible, giving the brain an opportunity to rewire itself and escape from the rigid patterns of thinking often observed in depression, anxiety, and addiction. And a flexible brain is a brain that can better handle adversity, it is more resilient and more fine-tuned to its environment. But two brain regions that are thought to be implicated in this through the direct action of psychedelic drugs are the frontal cortex which is involved in planning, decision making, and moderating social behavior, and the amygdala, responsible for emotions and how we comprehend those emotions. Now I think it should be easy to see how through modulating the connections between the brain's center of decision making and planning and the center of emotion that psychedelic drugs are able to exert their effects. Also it should be noted that though I won't be discussing it in this video for time constraints, psilocybin has also yielded very promising results in the treatment of OCD behaviors. For the next part of this video I will We'll be looking at just two clinical studies uh, because this is planning out to be my longest YouTube video yet and I'm not quite sure if I have the energy or mental fortitude to keep going but if you guys find that you're enjoying these longer in-depth video then please tell me in the comments below and I'll make and I'll keep making them. But back to the research. The two clinical studies that I'm planning to look at today look at the effects of psilocybin administration on one, alcohol dependence, and two, treatment-resistant depression. But even though I'm only looking at two small studies, I want to make it very clear right now that other studies have been carried out and have yielded very consistent and very similar results to the studies that I'm going to be speaking about today. These studies are definitely not anomalies. So let's start with alcohol dependence. In one study, 10 participants with uh, alcohol dependence received oral psilocybin in either one or two supervised sessions. And while the research scientists observed that uh, abstinence did not increase prior to the administration of the psilocybin, once the volunteers received the psychedelic treatment, a dramatic decrease in the number of drinking days was observed, down to a little over 10% between 5 to 8 weeks. 
and this was found to be sustained for the full follow-up period of 36 weeks. There was also a notable decline in alcohol cravings which was associated with the intensity of the psychedelic experience. What this means is that the volunteers who had the most intense or the deepest psychedelic experiences, trips, were also the ones who showed the greatest improvement in alcohol cravings and alcohol consumption. Though the authors of the study noted that while most volunteers showed a significant reduction in the number of drinking days, some volunteers appeared to be completely insensitive to the effects of psilocybin administration for one reason or another. And unlike in other conditions like depression and OCD, the dose that was required by the alcohol dependent group tended to be somewhat larger. There have also been a couple of studies that looked at psychedelic drugs in the context of nicotine addiction, and they've also yielded some very promising results. I'll probably end up discussing these studies in a later video, so if you want to see that, then make sure you subscribe. Now let's look at treatment resistant depression. First things first, what exactly is treatment resistant depression? Treatment resistant depression is depression that fails to respond to at least one antidepressant when the antidepressant is administered for enough time at an appropriate dosage. And it's actually more common than most psychiatrists would like it to be, with up to 60% of all patients failing to reach an adequate response with an antidepressant treatment. And so in this study we're looking at 20 volunteers with treatment resistant depression who were given two doses of psilocybin. 10 milligrams and 25 milligrams seven days apart. The research scientists observed that nine of the 20 patients showed significant improvement in their depressive symptoms as measured through the quiz questionnaire, with four patients apparently being cured. You can see in the graph that the quiz score dropped from an average of around 18 at baseline, indicating severe depression, to less than eight, meaning mild depression. These results were remarkable for several reasons. First, the clinicians were able to see a remarkable improvement within just one week. Contrast that to many first-line antidepressants where you only begin to see some level of improvement at least two weeks into treatment. And second, the effects persisted for the full follow-up period of six months, indicating that these gains were not just fleeting. Third is that nearly all or 19 of the 20 volunteers showed some improvement in their quid score, of which 9 showed significant improvement, out of which 4 went into complete remission. And finally, like in the alcohol dependence trial, the scientists were able to predict which of the volunteers would have the best response to psilocybin based on the intensity and quality of their psychedelic experience. Their trip. And again, these results were nothing out of the ordinary. They actually agree to a large part with other trials that have been carried out in the past. One issue I want to mention is the small size of these studies. Uh, the alcohol dependent study only had 10 volunteers and the treatment resistant depression study had 20. It makes it very hard to draw broad, meaningful conclusions out of these studies when their sizes are so small. And the scientists actually address this, and according to them, the reason why they are unable to expand their studies and sign up a lot more volunteers is because the regulatory bodies make it so, so difficult to procure or obtain enough psychedelic agents like LSD and psilocybin. So are psychedelics the future of psychiatry? Well, maybe. The truth is, despite all this research being extremely encouraging and proving that 1. Psychedelics are actually very safe and 2. They can be potentially very beneficial, what we actually need are larger studies and they need to be double-blinded. Once we have these larger studies, we can actually begin quantifying the positive effects that psychedelics can have on the volunteers and also identifying the people who stand to benefit the most from psychedelic therapy or treatment because it's unlikely that everyone is going to respond to psychedelic treatment. A lot of research clinicians will actively exclude people with a history of psychosis from their studies because it's believed that LSD and psilocybin can induce acute episodes of psychosis. And it's also important to realize that psychedelic therapy doesn't just involve dropping some acid in your room. It's actually an incredibly clinical experience. It needs to be carried out in a supportive setting. The volunteers are typically debriefed beforehand and get therapy afterwards to discuss and analyze the content of their trip. Long story short, you're unlikely to get very good results from psychedelic therapy without the actual therapy. But before any of this can happen, 
The regulatory bodies need to make psychedelics easier for research scientists to obtain so that they can carry out the larger trials that are needed. I really enjoyed making this video for you guys, so if you guys feel the same way, then don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and share it with your friends and family and make sure to subscribe to the channel if you are new here.